So what's happening in the keto community is people are being instructed to avoid carbs like the plague, keep the carb numbers low, like keep it down below 50, below 25, below 10, some people are saying in terms of grams of carbs. And what people are doing is, oh, I get to have this much lettuce. I get to have this little scrawny piece of lettuce. That's all I can have because it'll raise my carbs too much. And that's where the misconception comes in. Welcome back to Metabolic Health Solutions, where we empower health practitioners and self healers to heal themselves and heal their clients who have metabolic imbalances. I'm Dr. Rita Marie Loscalzo. I'm a functional nutrition practitioner. I'm the founder of the Institute of Nutritional Endocrinology. I'm the author of Unstoppable Health. Today, I want to talk to you about lowering hemoglobin A1C with carbs. So hemoglobin A1C is a measurement that is really basically telling you what the percentage of your red blood cells that are coated with sugar, glycosylated in scientific terms, right? So how much of your red blood cells are coated with sugar? Ideally, that number should be in the range of 4.8 to 5.2, ideally between 4.5 and 5. The lower, the better, because it means that you haven't been having a lot of high glucose swings. And you're going to see that in a lot of your patients that they have high glucose swings and their hemoglobin A1Cs are too high. When the hemoglobin A1C is too high, what happens is those sugar coated red blood cells, they become kind of sticky and they don't move and flow as well as they ought to. They also, if you think about if you've ever made taffy when you were a kid, or you take molasses and you put it in a pot and then you start to stretch it. And then when it cools down, there's these sticky parts to it. That's what happens to the red blood cells in your body. They're, they get sticky, they get pokey, and they can create inflammation in the blood vessels. So that's why we want to lower it. The other reason we want to lower it is because lowering it indicates that we're in a state where we are having good glucose control. So for example, the ranges and in conventional medicine, we want to have it below 5.7. Above 5.7, you are considered to have insulin resistance. And then when it gets into the sixes, it's considered to be diabetes. And that's, it's kind of like a marker of where you are in your glucose control. So we want to get it low. I mean, we're not going to get it all the way down to zero because obviously we have sugar in our blood all the time. We have to, to have energy. So somewhere in that 4.5 to five, a little bit higher than that can be okay. But right around that five, I think is that sweet spot for an A1C. When we think about optimal ranges for A1C, it's really kind of crazy in medicine that you can be at 5.6 and you're fine. There's no danger and you're at 5.7 and oh, now you're insulin resistant. The truth of the matter is you've been in danger ever since it got above five, you're increasing the risk factors associated with insulin resistance and glucose dysregulation. So all of the problems that happen when people are diagnosed with insulin resistance, those have been happening for decades before. And that's why we make a distinction in our community of pre-insulin resistance. Once you get into the range where your fasting blood sugar is over 90, your A1C is over five, you're in a state called pre-insulin resistance. And all of the damaging things that happen when you're diabetic are starting to happen to you, even though you don't have the diagnosis. So I think it's really, really important for us to keep this in mind and for us to be teaching our clients and our patients that this is so critical. So a lot of people are thinking that carbs are bad. The bad carbs are bad and there are good carbs that are not bad. So yes, in order to lower A1C and in order to reverse insulin resistance and prevent diabetes, we need to avoid the bad carbs, the carbs that cause blood sugar spikes, the carbs that are not, as Mindy Peltz calls them, nature's carbs, right? The ones that are processed in a lab, the ones that are isolated, the ones that are starches that are made into breads and flours, the ones that are sugars of any name, shape or form, honey, molasses, sugar, maple syrup, et cetera, that all have the ability to spike the glucose. Those are the carbs that we do need to lower in order to lower A1C. So what's happening in the keto community is people are being instructed to avoid carbs like the plague, keep the carb numbers low, like keep it down below 50, below 25, below 10, some people are saying in terms of grams of carbs. 
And what people are doing is, oh, I get to have this much lettuce. I get to have this little scrawny piece of lettuce. That's all I can have because it'll raise my carbs too much. And that's where the misconception comes in. The good carbs are those non-starchy vegetables that are loaded with phytochemicals and loaded with nutrients that people are avoiding and they're just pushing towards fat and they're getting some results imme immediately, but they're not having long-term health results. So it's really important that when we look at carbs, we don't just identify, you know, the carb in sugar is the same as the carb in cauliflower. It's not. In some people, the carbohydrate content in a cauliflower might raise their sugars a little bit too much. And that's part of what we do to customize for each person. But the truth of the matter is most people can eat unlimited amounts of non-starchy vegetables, high water content vegetables. And so we have to look at the, the what's called the net carb. So what does sugar have as a net carb? That means the carb after you subtract the amount of calories from fiber. Generally speaking, the carb content is the same as the net carb content because there is no fiber. In some foods, which might be like a potato, there's a little bit of fiber compared to the amount of carb. And so the net carb is a little bit lower than the total carb. But if you take something like your non-starchy vegetables, romaine, lettuce, kale, arugula, all of these foods, and when you start with the carb content of these wonderful high water content veggies and you subtract the fiber, there's a big difference between the carb content and the net carb content. And it's the net carb content that's problematic and can cause problems with rising A1Cs. So a lot of people wonder, well, how much lettuce can I have? And how much arugula can I have? And how much broccoli can I have? For most people, as much as you want. Here's the deal. You're not going to sit and binge it like you could cotton candy. And when we look, and I've been studying this for decades and watching people measure their glucose and watch what happens after a meal, you can eat an unlimited amount of most of these. Like things like cauliflower are a little higher, so they're more medium carb content. So if you're cooking cauliflower and you make three heads of cauliflower and you eat it, that might be a little too much. But if you eat three big bags of arugula, for example, it's unlikely to have a negative impact on your blood sugar. And remember that A1C is related to the excursions in our glucose levels. So if you can keep the carb intake, those good carb intake, the high water content vegetables, and if you can keep that and keep your glucose nice and steady. And we're going to see that over the course of two to three months of doing this, that the A1C lowers, even though the carb content is high. Understanding the interaction between the microbiome and the metabolic rate, microbiome and A1C, the microbiome and insulin resistance is something people don't think about very often, except when it comes to some of the drugs that are on the market. We'll, we'll go through that in another episode. But what happens is these the microbiome and the metabolism are so intimately connected. If you're listening to this in 2024, then you can check out our event, Reinvent 2025, which is happening early 2025. And we're going to go into this in great detail. It's an event that's intended for health practitioners, but we get a lot of, you know, self healers and health enthusiasts attending as well to learn more about these connections. So like anything, Anything in health, one size does not fit all. It works, doesn't work in shoe sizes. It doesn't work in health. And so we have to be able to tailor our plans for each individual person. One person might be able to eat a half a cup of sweet potatoes and their sugar goes up and another person eats three sweet potatoes and nothing happens. So the way that we know and the way that we can customize this for each individual is to be able to measure. Yes, testing the A1C every three months as we're watching it, go down, but also a CGM, which is an amazing tool that all of us should be able to have access to. And it measures your glucose continuously. And you can check, you can have people look and test meals and see what causes it to go up and what causes it to go down. So if you're going from say a keto plan where you're eating mostly meat and fat, and you're going into and starting to include more of these carbs, then the way to test how they do for you is to check. You can do it with a glucometer, with a traditional little finger stick, or you can do it with a glucose meter. 
and it's phenomenal to keep track of. And then on top of that, A1C every three months to just monitor your progress and see that it's getting better. If you wanna learn more about A1C and insulin resistance, click on the video to the right. I'm Dr. Rita Marie, and I'll see you there.